intensely for, for the last uh, six months through the whole um, body of um, um, British short stories, trying to work out what is British and what isn't. A surprisingly difficult task. Um, you know, Joyce, James Joyce, never actually held an Irish passport. But do we want to put Dubliners in? Well, probably not. But anyway, there, there are some things that um, have struck me about the um, about the short story from a British point of view. Um, some things that have uh, disappeared over time from the um, from the, the the general tendency of the, the the short story, and some things that it'd be rather good to um, to have back. On top of that, I've uh, come to some uh, fairly swift conclusions about um, um, some writers of short stories that are severely underrated. I think um, Arnold Bennett is a terribly underrated short story writer. They're wonderful, wonderful short stories. And ones who um, deserve to be dropped fairly soon. But perhaps we can um, come on to that. <laughs> right, I think, all right, I look forward to that. Um, since, we're, um, since we're going to come in this direction, um, Ruth Kagalchen, um, you, you come from the uh, American tradition of short story writing. Um, do, you, do you feel um, when you're writing uh, um, short fiction that, um, that, is it, that does, does, the, does this adjective American uh, c come into play at all? I mean, we've, we've seen the suggestion that the British short story is possibly something that can be identified. Do you think a similar identification can be made in relation to the American short story? You know, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear what, what sort of ideas have come across as Philip's been reading so much in the British short story, whether, you know, to figure out whether it's British or not. I do think there is something, I do think America has a kind of, uh, once had a sort of strong tradition, probably because there were so many magazines interested in publishing short stories, and then it's diminished a little bit. And, um, and, and, and I think that's almost a structural thing, not because the sort of form doesn't seem interesting to people anymore, but because there's not this sort of magazine culture anymore. And so now I feel like the novel is the game. The novel is the big game. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, that's, that's an interesting thought. Um, but let's just complete this thought. Um, Vikram Chandra, do you f consider yourself, uh, as and when you write your short stories, um, uh, do you consider yourself uh, involved in some Indian artistic production? Yeah. Well, saying that, that uh, the stories in the book kept getting longer and longer until they were essentially novellas uh, instead of being short stories. Um, I think John Barth said once that um, there are two kinds of writers, taker outers and putter inners. And I think I'm a putter inner. And I think to really be a good short story writer, you have to be a taker outer. Um, so that finally what you're left with is one action, one vision, one thing. I tend to like multiplicity. But Vikram, could I ask you, because I'm just asking this because last night I was reading um, a, an anthology by Kushwant Singh of the Indian short story. And he begins very tendentiously by saying the Indian short story is a, an identifiable thing. And it follows the rules, he said, of the short story. I don't know what these rules are. Um, it's limited to two or three characters at most and you know, you made it sound very kind of, very kind of uh, limited, but very structured. And then, very tendentiously, he said, um, for for these reasons, many uh, many critics believe that uh, the that India has kept hold of the art of the short story, whereas it's been lost to the West, which came as news to me. But do you think that do you think that you stand um, at a particularly awkward angle as a putter in? to the tradition of the Indian short story? Well, I don't know if there really is. Uh, I'm interested to hear that, that you guys think, or at least you think, that there's, there's a short story. Um, I think it seems to me that in some ways, the modern short story is a particularly global form. So if you look back at history, um, 
prose writing, fiction writing in prose was pretty lowly, right? So if you were ambitious in classical India or classical Rome, you wrote poetry. And if you were particularly ambitious, you wrote epic poetry. Um, and people who wrote any kind of extended prose were novelists, were dealing with, with issues that were considered essentially non-literary. So this interesting thing happened in the 18th and 19th centuries where people like Chekhov take this sort of um, form that belongs to the low and then convert it into high literary expression. And I think that has been an international form um, in which influences have talked across cultures and, and um, it's been part of modernity itself. Right, well that is very interesting. Um, uh, Rivka, um, you mentioned on this subject you said something um, a minute ago about the novel being somehow the big game and implying, I suppose, that the short story, simply possibly because of its shortness, is the little game. Is the little game. Um, what, do you, what, you, what do you think about that? Hold the mic. You know, I, the, I like the idea of the putter-inner and the taker-outer um, because I, I, I think one of... Um, Edgar Allan Poe and uh, Jorge, Luis Borges were both great short story writers who almost didn't write a novel. I guess Poe wrote something quite long, but uh, you wouldn't quite call it a novel. And uh, Borges was sort of asked once, you know, I mean, then he devoted his whole life to literature and letters, and he certainly wrote a lot. And why did he never write a, a novel? And he said, I just, I never thought, why would I take so much space when, if, if I could 
either very topical and disposable. I mean, reading for the um, the um, the Penguin Anthology is um, is astonishing to me how many short stories were written in immediate response to some public event. I mean, the the um, the literature of short stories about um, the the London Blitz, um, written at the time, just as it was happening. Um, is is astonishing. You know, in a way, you know, these these things take years to filter through to the novel. But you can write a five thousand word um, a short story very very quickly. Either that, or as Rivka says, um, a something that is that needs to be reread and mulled and thought over. And it's really the variety of the form that's so um, that's so tantalising. Um, I, I, I like the word pressure uh, that yeah. you've been using. I think um, for me as a writer of longer stuff, it's, it seems immensely hard. Uh, the short story seems to me a much more demanding form than a novel um, in that there's so much pressure on language and then on the form of the thing itself, it has to perfectly represent whatever content, emotion that you're trying to get at. And, and I suppose in, in terms of Indian connections, an analogy one could think about was miniature, the tradition of miniature painting in India, where, where suddenly, because it's being done at such a small scale, each individual line becomes so much more resonant and important. And that because the frame is so small, if you put pressure on that frame, if, you, if your visual imagery starts to disrupt it, it feels like an explosion. Um, and so uh, the, the best example of that in the Indian tradition would be Manto, of course. Um, who wrote these amazing short stories about partition where it, everything is sudden, it happens within a page, but the violence feels like an, an entire world collapsing because it's in such a contained form. Um, and I think that's what gives those stories their particular power and their sort of shocking force which stays with you long after you've finished reading one of those. And, and, you, don't, and you don't think that this this kind of impact um, is readily available from a novel or was a different so a different kind of impact it's a very different kind of impact I think with a novel uh, or at least when I'm writing what I want is these this uh, I guess in Sanskrit or Hindi the word would be dhwani reverberation which is this immense echoing kind of connectivity between various parts of the novel that then speaks to you of an entire world um, but, but the connections between all those different parts are what makes that happen, and you don't have that in the short story. In the short story, um, it, it's just the thing itself and what it can represent. Also, in a, in a novel, you can't rely on your reader reading something again. Um, so if, you, if, something is, if something really counts, then you've got to lead up to it. You've got to put a bit more weight on it. A reader can't... Um, there really can't be a strong risk that most readers are going to miss the point you're making. But a, a short story can perfectly well turn on a tiny detail that a reader has to go back and hunt for. There's a, um, a wonderful late short story uh, by Penelope Fitzgerald, who was a very um, indirect and suggestive writer. It's called The Red-Haired Girl. And it's all about uh, two painters in the 19th century um, going to a Brittany village and having a couple of conversations with a servant girl and one of them agrees to meet the girl and says, if they're Parisians, um, I'll meet you at uh, quarter to five. And she says, um, I, can't, um, I, I can't be sure about the quarter to. And then she disappears and she never turns up and um, they're very puzzled, and then they find out that she's been sacked from her job and she's gone, gone home. And the whole point, and that's the, really the end of the story, and the, whole, the story doesn't seem to make sense until you find out what she was sacked for stealing. And it's a list of three or four things. It's like cutlery, but it includes a watch. And if you don't notice the, the significance of her stealing the watch, it's because she wants to be there at a quarter to five. You know, and that's, uh, but you, uh, I read this short story, it came out in the TLS um, in the late 90s, and I remember reading this short story and going, 
I don't understand this. I don't understand this. And I think it was the fourth time I read the short story. Maybe I'm just very slow, but it was, it was the fourth time I read the short story that I had the faintest idea what it was all about. And you can do that with a short story if it's just a few thousand words long. You can ask your reader to reread it in exactly the same way that a poet would ask his readers to read a lyric poem repeatedly. I love that idea. It's almost like a slip of the pen where it, it feels like a kind of random detail, but it gives a kind of capacity to the story. Like I remember reading Nabokov talking about uh, the famous short story, The Nose by Gogol, in which sort of, you know, a baker wakes up one day, his wife's sort of already mad at him. He doesn't quite know why. Then he slices into the bread and there's a nose in the, in the middle of the bread. And then you sort of get this huge, this quick picture of the baker's life and the story leaves them completely. That's maybe four percent of the story and then it turns out the nose sort of has a personality and is going around town sort of in, um, on his own and that's the center of the story and yet when you leave the story you almost feel, you, you, even though it's just a, a little gesture, somehow the kind of that initial domestic scene feels as important as everything else. Kind of. um, you're, you're, both, you're both suggesting, in fact all of you are suggesting, um, uh, the, the short story um, is to be read in a slightly different way. That when we sit down, um, and readers are sophisticated creatures, we all make automatic adjustments when, when we see the length of the text. Um, one of them being in the short story, I suppose, that we should be prepared to be puzzled, mystified a little bit. We should read it as one might uh, read a poem, perhaps. Um, um, do you, um, Vikram, um, do you have um, any, strong, any strong feelings about any particular short story writers who, 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 who you feel um, are, as it were, uh, one can't ignore which, uh, and, and which are, you know, uh, which have influenced you, for example? Um, I, I teach a course in the short story every year. I'm about to start teaching it next week. And we always start with Isaac Babel. Um, there's an amazing short story called My First Goose, uh, and it's, a, it's set during the, the Civil War um, in, uh, between 1914 and 1918, and uh, it's about a bespectacled, educated man being introduced to this land of uh, the landscape of war. And what Bible achieves in that is this astonishing replication or suggestion of an entire world that has been disrupted. And I, it's very hard to describe because partly it's the language and the rhythms. And, um, and again, there is a very small action. Like, uh, a goose gets killed in the middle of the story. And somehow that goose getting killed comes to represent all the horror that has taken place in this landscape. Um, and then astonishingly enough, it also becomes a story of fraternity because once this goose has been killed, has been ritually sacrificed, as it were, our outsider becomes an insider. He's accepted into the fraternity of warriors and violence. Um, and I, I think that particular aspect of the short story, that in, within a very short space, um, you can represent an entire landscape, an entire world, and a way of being, because in some sense, that story is an anthropology of soldiers. Uh, and what they do and what they become through this participation in violence. Uh, if you haven't read it, go home and look for it and, and read it. Well, Phil Philip, I mean, you've just been surveying the British short story now for the last six months, as you say. Um, uh, what, what, what and, and, and you've suggested that, you, that some, some short stories are, are more interesting to you as the editor than others. Um, could you perhaps expand on that? Yes, well, I'm not sure that I really, I'm really any closer to the, um, to the national tradition of the British short story, if there is such a thing. There are a couple of things that I've noticed that the British seem to do much more than uh, other people. I'm going to have to make a very serious effort to limit the number of ghost stories, <laughs> for instance. And I was saying this to, um, I was saying this to Rivka before, and she, she suggested a very interesting theory about this, which is that, you know, the British for many years would have lived with the noises of, sh of servants, 
elsewhere in the house, um, and the way in which the noises that servants are making downstairs might kind of merge into the noises of the supernatural. And that feels very, um, very accurate. But there's, there, there are too many very good ghost stories um, out there. Another thing that um, has struck me is that it's very difficult for most British writers to write for long um, without starting to be funny. Um, the sense of comedy at the center of it is really, uh, really astonishing. Um, there's a, uh, and in the most unexpected places, really. I think the st story that I'm going to um, put in from Wilkie Collins, who's known as a kind of blood and thunder extremist sensation novelist, um, is a simply hilarious story about a man who rents a, rents a house and then finds that um, the previous tenant of this house, who's a grief-stricken widow, insists on knocking at the door at all hours and being admitted to the uh, <laughs> dining room where she used to sit with her beloved husband. And he's trying to have a party and she's just saying, oh, just let me into the drawing room. I just want to sit and weep in the corner for a while. <laughs> and he's being driven absolutely out. Of but it's, it's a very, it's, it's just not a very characteristic Wilkie Collins story. But it's, um, but it's, very, it's a very kind of English thing to find a, a joke in a most unexpected place. The other thing that I think I've, I've discovered and I, and I rather love is that we as literary authors, we do love the sensitive vignette. We, we love the one that, um, that opens nowhere and ends with the weather slightly changing. You know, and some of those, some of those stories are, are the, the stories I love best in the world, you know, Chekhov short stories. Count the number of times a short story by Chekhov ends with the, the sentence, or variation on the sentence, outside it was starting to rain again. <laughs> it's amazing. But the thing that I've started to develop a real taste for is the vulgar, appalling, twist in the tail short story. And I think we ought to um, have another look at that. We might not want to start writing them ourselves, but I think we ought to recognize what a lot of pleasure there is to be had in that. And there was one short story that I read quite recently, and it wasn't exactly a twist in the tale, but it wasn't far from it. And it's a story by the American writer Daniel Orozco called uh, Orientations. And it's a, um, it's a monologue, and it's in the form of a... You know when you start a new job, there's some poor sucker who's trained to take you around the office and point out where the tea-making facilities are and where the bathrooms are and what you've got to do every Tuesday morning. And it's in the form of that, but as it goes on, the person giving the monologue starts to say, and in this cubicle is so-and-so. He's actually a serial killer, but we won't discover that for <laughs> another six months, by which time he will have murdered this secretary and this... And it's, uh, it's absolutely transfixing because of that whipping out of rabbits from the hat. So I think when the, when the anthology finally appears, don't be surprised if you get hold of it and see that there are some very, very vulgar <laughs> examples of the twist in the tale. I <laughs> rather love those. Um, Rivka? Well, I just want to know what the vulgar twist in the tale might be. I mean, is it, the, is it, is it sort of a revealed identity or a vampire story? I, 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 you, it's, it's very, in fact, it's a sort of short story style. You've been suggestive, and you sort of set my imagination going, but I'm not sure what it might be. Well, no, I can't give away. This. Okay. <laughs> Readers get so cross if you give away the end of the sto short story. If I, s if I sat here now and said, for anyone who's thinking of reading Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth Bennet marries Darcy in the end, <laughs> people would be furious. No, I can't. I can't. Um, the twist in the tale, Rivka, do you have any thoughts about... Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I guess, the, I guess you know, there was for a while this tradition of, of sort of fairly well-respected stories, um, Saki, um, O. Henry, 
where it, it became a problem where you were sort of waiting sort of with bated breath for the twist in the tail. Um, and and so, so in a sense, the twist, I guess, eventually had to be that there would be no twist. So then maybe we've turned the corner and we've turned the corner again and now we're back at the beginning. Maybe there'll be a little bit more of that. I mean, I suppose one of the one of the challenges for somebody writing a story. I mean, as you as you say, the twist. We've had the twist in the tale. We've had the epiphany. We've had the, um, as you say, the anticlimactic reference to the weather, <laughs> um, and uh, and we've had certain sort of, um, you know, postmodern jokes about how plot develops and so forth, um, and yet at the same time we've just had a Nobel Prize. Um, given to Alice Munro, of course, who is uh, a, a great uh, writer of short stories, obviously, in, in, in a rather recognizable, uh, as it were, quiet, traditional um, way. Vikram, I was wondering, um, you know, if you, if, where is, what, what is the, what does the, a short story writer do um, who wants to, who's, who wants to develop the idea of the short story? Who wants to sort of push a little bit at the uh, conventions um, that, 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 as we know, are, are are fairly recognizable in the form. They are. We, we are. Right. We have very recognizable conventions. Right. I, you know, I, I'm all for vulgar twists. I think I think they're a fine thing. Um, and, and not for, not least because. Going back and forth in the United States, I also lived through the New Yorker story, right? Which is, I, and then I went across to the supermarket and felt sad, right? So, or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, and so, uh, I think having the kind of energy that that uh, that you're suggesting that that takes uh, risks not only in terms of form uh, of of structure, but also in terms of risking vulgarity um, and risking bad taste and, and being ill-mannered. I think that is really valuable. Um, and I'd like to see more of that in general. Yes, I think um, I think Chuck Palahniuk is very <laughs> underrated. There's a st there's a short story of his called Guts, and it's so distasteful <laughs> and horrible that he's taken to reading it out in public and counting how many members of the audience faint. Um, and um, yes, we ought to be more of that. More of that, I reckon. Do you think? Sorry. One of them had a seizure. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, um, I'm not we're going to we're going to have a we're, we'll have a um, we'll have a good fifteen minutes uh, uh, devoted to uh, audience questions and so forth. So w maybe we'll we'll do it in that way. Um, I'm sorry, Philip, but what I, uh, you were saying um, the 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 question of um, the question of the the broad the the vulgar, the outbreaks of, of violence within a, um, a, a short format, I think is, um, is a very tempting one, really. Um, the, um, the thing that I, I do think is that within, the, within a very few pages, um, carefully handled, you can mount an escalation of, um, of horrors and violence and, um, and sheer bad taste. Um, much more effectively than over a, a long novel, and I think of um, I think of H. P. Lovecraft, who you know in many ways was not a very elegant writer, but um, in some of his short stories, and the, the one I absolutely adore is *The Thing on the Doorstep*. What a great title for a short story, *The <laughs> Thing on the Doorstep*. Um, but w if you look at um, if you look back at even even at Chekhov, we always think of Chekhov as being a sensitive, um, uh, a sensitive writer of doings in country houses and people raising their hands to their brow in the orchard, and that's <laughs> the main drama. Actually, if you seriously sit and read through Chekhov, there's extraordinary amounts of violence and murder and and go and and ghosts. Even there's a terrifically gothic one called the Black Monk. So. I don't know. I think there's more in the um, in the traditional short story than um, uh, than we perhaps assume. Right, and and I think I mean, I, although I wouldn't accuse her of bad taste, uh, certainly of violence and extremity, Flannery O'Connor is such such so perfect in that. And again, what's interesting in those short stories is that um, you know you get 
you get something bad happening, but then you don't really think it's going to get worse, and then you get a serial killer, and then you get, <laughs> and then you get children being killed, and, and then you get the, the point of your character being shot in the chest, and, it's <laughs> all, and then it's over. And you're left with this feeling of, I have to say, wonder, right? Like, how did she just do that? And, and it only works at that scale. I mean, I don't know if you could do a novel about people going on a long journey through the South and having all these things happen. And I guess it would eventually stop hold on, being hold on. upsetting. It, it, would, it would stop being upsetting for some reason. You would think, well, you know, you only lost seven children in this novel. Like, it, even when, when it's just one, it sort of works. And I think the short story also has this magic where it can play with where the violence is. Like a, a story I read recently that I, I thought was remarkable for that was a Mary Gateskill story where basically on sort of word 400, you know, the hitchhiker pulls out a gun and says, you need to do this, that, and that, and that, and that. And that sort of seems like it should be the climax of the story. But instead, this, the way that it turns is she says, you know, I'm not that attached to my life. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm driving to Detroit, and I'm not going to change my path, basically. And, and so then, in a weird way, it's as if the sort of violent encounter you were waiting for is gotten over with so quickly that a, a kind of different a different kind of violence sort of is able to show itself, which, which I do think in a novel wouldn't quite work. The, the most um, complained about story in the whole history of the New Yorker is always said to have been Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. And I think it was so complained about because it begins like an absolutely classic New Yorker um, short story with uh, a lot of families in a raw, in a lovely rural setting, preparing for their holiday, and they're meeting up, and they're going to meet on the village green, and you know, festivals going to take place, and then they start. To, then the lottery box is draw, is brought out, and they start drawing lots and saying, "Oh well, it's it's not our turn this year." And then somebody draws out a piece of paper with a black spot on it, and then all the families go and ca gather a rock and stone her to death. <laughs> And people, <laughs> the readers of The New Yorker were so appalled by this because it's, uh, it's just not what they expected. But you couldn't possibly write a novel on the premise of the lottery. It had to be within that uncontrollable, um, uncontrollable tiny, mad space. Um, Vikram, you mentioned um, genre and how the short story in, uh, at the moment is particularly hospitable to uh, writers of science fiction, horror, and so forth. Um, and I'm beginning to see a connection between your comment and the comments we've been um, we've been hearing since then, um, which have the um, which give the impression that the short story, uh, which is widely known for uh, you know extremely well-behaved prose and a sort of an admirable sensitivity on the part of the writer is in fact um, an extre a, a, a vehicle for all kinds of uh, subversion and violence when looked at more carefully. Um, do you, have you, staying with this question of genre, uh, do you, have you been reading um, these, these genre stories with any, with any great attention? Is there something you can report from, from your readings? Uh, no, um, well, science fiction, I think, particularly delights in the problem story. Um, and and it, it, there's a sort of uh, uh, great pleasure, as in the detective story, where you see your spaceman presented with a certain problem, and he's got a, she's got to solve this technical problem within the space of the story in a particularly intelligent and creative way. Um, uh, but also, uh, I think some of the, the most um, interesting thinking about the kind of world that we live in now and that we will live in tomorrow happens within the space of science fiction. And I'm not claiming sort of literary greatness for those stories. But, um, to people who live in that world, it's often frustrating when some literary writer writes about um, you know, the latest technical advance and the dystopia it puts us in, and somebody was doing that in science fiction in 1980. <laughs> um, so, so I think for me, it's a really fertile way of exploring um, these, these kind of social questions, which are treated then as problems. It also gives you a space um, in which you can uh, posit a certain kind of culture of society and then work out what it means to live within that. And 
um, how it changes the people who live in them. There's a there's a sort of game playing element in science fiction as well. It's in science fiction and short stories. Um, they're very much a, a sort of puzzle for the reader and to to work out what could be the solution for. If it, I think of um, there's a, a wonderful short story by Arthur C. Clarke called The Lion of Comar um, about a sort of virtual society, but it's um, it's rather like um, it, it's rather like a, a Sherlock Holmes story in structure. It's presented you with a baffling surface and then follows the explorer, or who in another, uh, in another genre would be the detective, as he tries to understand what has led up to um, this, this point. But the reader is supposed to be, I think, very slightly ahead of the explorer. Um, Sherlock Holmes doesn't really do that. He's, you know, you're, the reader's supposed to catch up with the solution um, as Sherlock Holmes reveals it. Um, but I think a lot of very effective um, detective stories, um, you're expected to be slightly in advance of it and for feel very clever for having worked out what this solution is. And certainly that's true of you know, short, stories and, uh, short stories in science fiction, having a, a kind of game playing element to them. Remember too that these, uh, these stories were very often originally published in magazines just before the crossword. Um, it is the kind of the lighter puzzle element of literature sometimes. You know, I was thinking about the science, the science fiction problem because they, they, I do think that they often feel they're in a gutter, although I think it looks like a pretty nice gutter to me. There's a lot of readers, there's a lot of chatter, it's like a full community. And I was thinking, mm, one thing the short story seems to have a tight relationship to genre, whether it's science fiction or horror or whatever it might be, is that it's nice, if, if you're gonna be short, it's nice to be able to lean and sort of quickly gesture towards like a whole and body of thinking like earlier about sort of dystopia, scientific, di science dystopic landscape. And there's a great J.G. Ballard story that's only two pages long. And the only reason it can work as being a two page long story is because of genre. So it sort of quickly conjures the whole genre of sort of waking up and being the last man on earth and some terrible environmental or other catastrophe has happened, it's not quite clear. And so it doesn't have to, like a novel, lay it all out because it is in genre and we've all sort of like thought about these things before. And then it just does a, a twi one little twist on it at the end. The guy sort of confirms that it's the end of the world, confirms there's no one else on earth, you know, sees a few birds, there's a little wildlife, gets back to his study and says, good, finally I can get some work done. And then, you know, but it wouldn't work if there wasn't a genre behind it. And it does have the sort of pathos of a kind of New Yorker short story in the sense that you also picture, here's this writer, he has like a 17 children, I think only like six, but you know, many children, he's supporting them all, he's writing all the time, and you think, oh, for him, the nightmare is a fantasy story. Like, for him, it's sort of a dream. And for, for many, um I think the one thing that I've learned as a as a writer is that um, you, if you're going to venture into a genre, you have to do it full time. Um, there's no the, there's nothing so so unsatisfying as a writer suddenly deciding, oh, I'm going to I'm going to write one science fiction story and then I'm going to get back to my um, my my sensitive literary work. I think the audiences <laughs> simply hate it. Um, John Banville came into such, for such a lot of online hatred when he remarked of his uh, detective novels, he writes under the name of Benjamin Black, that he'd undertaken them as, um, as, a, as escapism from his serious work. Because, you know, detective writers really don't think of their work as escapism from, from anything in particular. And there's, there's some justice in that, that the best genre writing is on the whole I think, written by specialists. Right, and, and I was gonna add that, that there is this long conversation that's been going on between these writers for generations. So if you just step in and you don't already know what the conventions are and what the, the parameters of this conversation have been, you can make very sort of silly mistakes. And I think particularly in science fiction, uh, the people are very attentive to your world building. 
really don't understand how, how detail-oriented people can be un until you've heard two science fiction nerds arguing about whether you know the, the, the Model 3 cannon could have penetrated <laughs> the, the, this, the, the armor, forward armor, on a class 3 starship or not. <laughs> and, and people really get specific and interested and want the internal logic of that world to hold. Um, and so if you don't know what, what all of this sort of, what's already happened, um, you can seem like a really naive outsider. Well, um, I think the time has come to um, open the uh, conversation up. Um, d does anyone have a question for the, for the panel? This gentleman is, yes. Uh, hi, my question is for Philip. Uh, you were talking about the New Yorker short story and uh, uh, Raymond Carver's. I think it was uh, what we talk about when we talk about love, whose draft, initial draft was put up on the New Yorker site and then the very rigorous editing which it had undergone. And New Yorker has this consistent style. I mean, you can tell it's a New Yorker story, right? Very well-behaved prose, uh, minus adverbs, minus frills, etc. Do you think this is a good thing? Uh, how, how, what are your views upon this? Is, is this? Do you view it more of a good thing or a bad thing? Restricting well, prose like this. Well, can I can I um, ask? Well, Rivka is the, is uh, regularly publishes short stories in the New Yorker, <laughs> so um, perhaps we could uh, perhaps we could ask her to um, to respond to that uh, comment. I, I do think that's sort of. I, I I do think it's not true, the sort of myth of the New Yorker story being it, but we all know what a New Yorker story is, so even if the New Yorker doesn't consistently publish New Yorker stories, it's still a helpful category, <laughs> because we know that we're sort of talking about the sort of upper middle class suburban white family which undergoes a mild change, which I think is something that was more true, although of course not even true then, in, in the 1960s, the 50s and 60s, there was a sort of period where you might describe a story like that. but. In truth, I would say the New Yorker only is tough on style in that they always make you put a capital I on the word internet, which is just <laughs> terrible and really unattractive. But uh, otherwise, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure they're, they're so rough. The Carver stories that were edited by Gordon Lish, I mean, you almost think, oh, well, those were two, they were collaborators. Maybe you prefer the Carver story or maybe you pr pr before the Lish edit or maybe not, but it's almost not, it's just not a normal editorial relationship, wouldn't you say? No, that's not, that's not normal. I think there are the, um, the list of supposed rules that uh, Harold Ross um, put in place in the early years of The New Yorker, um, they're in Thurber's book about him, my years, what's it called, The Years with Ross? Um, and actually, I have to say, they're wonderful rules. <laughs> they really are wonderful rules. The, the one that I'm always giving to my students at Bath Spa University is don't vary the verbs of speech. And it's true, it's, absolute, it's one of the things that we're always told to do by our kind of fourth grade English teacher. If you say, she said in one line, then the next line of writer dialogue say, he muttered, then he reiterated. <laughs> She ejaculated. <laughs> and uh, and if, you, if you're reading a writer who does this, it drives you up the wall because after a while you're not reading the dialogue, you're just looking for the next extraordinary verb of speech. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a great defender of the New Yorker's um, editorial policy. I say that in a sycophantic way because they've never ever accepted a story of mine. So uh, I don't know. Maybe or mine. Or mine. Um, I, see, I see another hand up there. They just turned me down last week. <laughs> And then after, after, sorry, after this, after this gentleman, there's that hand over there. Um, so uh, I was wondering about the nature of uh, the evolution of the short story, and that 50 years ago, when you looked at commercial uh, short stories by, say, uh, Asimov or Dahl, maybe a little longer than that, but you see the last question, that was pretty experimental at the time, or. Um, you have some of Dahl's stories as well, or even before that, the Rose Borges. But now, when you look at uh, the 90s, you see writers like Amy Hempel, or um, now you have George Saunders, who ends stories with cliffhangers. Like, there is a short story called The Falls in Pastoralia, which ends with a cliffhanger, literally. And um, I was wondering if uh, what your opinion is about uh, how accepting audiences have become about uh, in terms of um, the nature of the short story and how uh, you can um, 
well, you can uh, deviate from structure, basically. It doesn't have to be the build and uh, climax anymore. It can be something totally different. Well, that, thank you very much. Uh, Vikram, maybe I can ask you to uh, address this question. Uh, or this comment. Uh, I suppose it goes in cycles, really. Um, uh, there's always a sort of pendulum swing between um, maybe that sort of 60s and 70s New Yorker story um, that impels or, or has a certain presence in the cultural sphere that then impels another generation of writers to sort of walk away from that. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if I can, if I really have any intelligent things to say about what the current situation of the short story is. Uh, uh, maybe my reading in the current short story is widespread enough. Um, I would just say that it's always reckless behavior to assume that um, your readers are going to be um, intensely aware, sophisticated people, such as the attendees of the Jaipur Literary Festival. Um, some of them could not be trusted to tell the difference between an ironic cliffhanger and a rubbish cliffhanger. <laughs> you, could, you could write at the end of a short story in the New Yorker, and then I woke up and it was all a dream. And probably 70% of your readers would say, well, that's not ironic, that's rubbish. Or it would never cross their mind that it was ironic in the first place. So <laughs> I, think, um, I think I'm going to stay away from ironic twists. Yes, over there. Hi, I wonder what you feel about the modern taste for novels that are really basically a series of linked short stories. Um, any of you as readers. We could argue, right, that it's a form of cheating. Oh, well, thank you for that very interesting question. Uh, Rivka? It does feel like a form of cheating, but every once, in a while, every once in a while it's amazing. I mean, I guess people come often, and something people will cite will, uh, will be uh, Sherwood Anderson, but it, but it has to accumulate. I sort of thought it was interesting the way Vikram was talking about what, you're, you're tr you, know, what you value as you're sort of putting a novel together, and, and, and uh, you used a word, that I didn't know, but that made me picture sort of fault lines under the earth, and this sort of what sort of connects things sort of, and adds an extra power, and, and I, I, you'd like to think there would be a way for stories to accumulate in that way, but probably most of the time they don't. Um, I'm rubbing my hands together with glee because I think this is my vicarious specialist subject. The PhD <laughs> student of mine wrote a PhD on this exact subject, so, I could talk to you for the next 20 minutes about um, Tim Winton's The Turning and, um, and V.S. Nye Paul's Inner Free State and so on and so on and so on. He, Sherwood Anderson is the um, founding, um, founding father of all of this. I think in a way we can be cynical about this and say it's an ingenious way for short story writers to persuade the Booker Prize jury to read their books. <laughs> <laughs> or we can say that it's an interesting response to the fragmentation of, um, of modern life. And, you know, in the hands of people like David Mitchell, these, um, uh, these parallel, um, parallel narratives, these only tangentially, um, tangentially connected narratives, they do start to feel true to the sort of um, experience of modern life where you just touch on somebody's life and you affect it in some marginal way and you never find out what the end of the story is. I'm rather drawn to them. I always enjoy them, not least because it's got that nice feature of the collection of short stories that quite often you can skip a chapter if it's not really working for you and doesn't make much difference. Uh, um, I think it's a completely viable and wonderful form and it has a particular uh, power that is not available in the singular short story or in the the continuous novel in that uh, what you can do is by, by, uh, by, by doing a kind of mosaic of small seemingly mundane moments, you can build this sort of profound emotional impact. And I was actually looking uh, for, on my phone, for, uh, I'm really bad at names, so I'm gonna forget the name of the book and the name of Peter Ornette, who lives in San Francisco. Do you know who we're talking about? Yes. Yeah? 
he, he writes these novels which aren't even, uh, they're in fragments, but they're not even short story, uh, individual short stories, they're just sort of splinters from the lives of these various characters and he moves back and forth in time. And it helps that he writes like an angel, but what, what the form does, it, it sort of accumulates this mirroring power slowly and steadily as you go through the novel. And it's quite astonishing. And I, I don't think that would work uh, in any other way. Right, thank you. Um, one more question we have time for. Um, I've noticed that certain writers like Taolin and Marie Calloway, they use blogs now to write short stories. And those short stories, I mean, they aren't accepted, they aren't taken seriously because they use that medium. Do you see that changing? I, I hope it changes. I mean, in, in the sense that it, it, every medium seems like it, it pushes a different kind of ideal. And you know, somehow when things are in the past, they all seem sort of grand and amazing. And, and uh, a, a, a sort of writer that I really admire is this uh, Japanese woman from the 10th century. And back then, First of all, it was embarrassing to write in Japanese. It was only something women did. Everyone else wrote in Chinese. But they had this habit of writing basically almost tweets, a bit longer than a tweet. Like every time you saw someone, you'd send a card, like a calling card back and forth. And they basically developed incredible poetic ability because you're constantly writing these short pressured things that weren't that valued at the time, but like later acquired value. And I, I imagine that there are are more than a few people who are developing a kind of special language that makes the most sense kind of coming out in these little dispatches, like on a blog. But I don't, yeah. Well, Jennifer Aiken, right? Did it in the, in the New Yorker in quite a fabulous fashion. Um, uh, but I finally found it. It's Peter Orner, and the book is called Last Car Over the Sagamore Bridge. Um, if you haven't read it. I think the, um, the question of the uh, short stories in blogs, I think there's no reason why not. Um, it just needs a masterpiece to be written in that form. And I think one of the things that's waiting to happen to exploit the capacity of online, on-screen reading is the, I, 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 I'm such an idiot, I don't know, even know what the term is, that, that underlined thing that you click on and it takes you through to something else. And hyperlink, thank you, I knew I knew it. Um, and that, it seems to me, would be the ideal way to structure a narrative like um, the Arabian Nights. Wouldn't it be wonderful? You know those, when a story begins, if you just kind of click through and instead of having to go back to it and think you could kind of read on or you could go through and follow the trail of events. I think the, you know, all it, all it will take is for somebody, um, somebody really talented just to envisage the form of a blog or the online thing and write something really well. The thing that needs to happen for online writing is for the quality of writing to be as good as, um, as, as in the in traditional forms. And as far as I know, that the masterpiece hasn't quite happened yet, but I may be completely wrong or ignorant. And, well, uh, I think uh, it's, it's there, there was a sort of movement that started in the 90s to exploit uh, the structures, the new structures made available. They called it hyperfiction. And it turned out actually that a lot of it was terribly bad. <laughs> and and uh, not just because it was badly written or it wasn't a masterpiece, but there's an interesting paradox that happens is that when you give up too much control to the reader, the reader actually perhaps doesn't want that much control. And, and so uh, it's an interesting real problem. How do you tell stories within this vast new space? And I think the people who face it are facing it most squarely are the people in video gaming. Because you can either build a straight narrative if you've played some straight person, first person shooters. It's like you're a rat in a maze and you're led from one place to the other. And then, then there's other huge open world uh, games uh, like Grand Theft, right? Where you're sort of let loose in a city and there is no story except the one that you make up yourself. Um, and I don't know, I don't think anybody's really solved that problem quite yet. The well, I'm just, I'm gonna have to, I'm getting all signals here. Uh, we've, we've run over. Um, the, uh, which is ironic, I suppose, in the short story discussion. Um, thank you all very much for, um, for coming.
and our thanks to our three wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram, Joseph, Rivika, and Philip.